I said, there was a circle back to sort of the stuff that interested us here. And again, you know, the, the first question is, you know, for, for a lot of these use cases, for instance, that have to deal with this class imbalance, where the class imbalance is really significant, and the class you're interested in, in predicting is very, very rare. And if so, you know, what alternative solutions might there be? Uh, you know, uh, it's sort of linked to the second discussion point as well, because that's mentioning the fact that this is an older algorithm, this is 2002, there have been advances. One very popular um, advancement on this exact technique is called the adaptive synthetic sampling, the ADASYN, um, that does essentially the same thing, but it uses uh, the concept of, I guess, the density profile in order to apply some weights to how the, I believe it's how the distance is computed. Or maybe there's, you know, even more exotic ways uh, of dealing with this, like, you know, generative uh, adversarial networks or other ways. I mean, there's a lot of people who are probably dealing with creation of synthetic data by training just neural networks themselves or, you know, GANs in this case. Um, and then, you know, as, as we mentioned, you know, we're, we're interested in this algorithm for its potential in dealing with class imbalance, but also as the inspiration for maybe generating synthetic data. So I'm just kind of curious from people in the audience who are familiar in that space, you know, what other methods do you do? Do you think this is a good way of doing it? You know, I, I've got arguments to why I kind of like this idea, but you know, I'm open for discussion. I'm really curious to see what everyone else has to say. Um, can we, if there, can we address at first the, uh, any clarification question left from the talk, then move on to the discussion points for other people. Please go to the slide that you show the table, small, with different parameters versus the previous algorithm. So uh, I'll mention, maybe I'll go back to so the way that they generated the results is with this tenfold cross-validation. Um, I guess it's something that I didn't pay attention to when I was reading the paper, whether that their cross-validation worked with the entire oversampled data set or whether they oversampled just the training data and they tested it on a non-oversampled okay. data set. So I can't answer that, I apologize. I, about that ahead of time to, to look at that a little closer. But, um, you know, you, you bring up a good point, but I, I think I had a conversation earlier with someone else and you're, you're introducing some additional algorithm into your model. It's got parameters, like anything else, parameters can be tweaked and you're generally gonna find some optimal parameter that's just gonna work for your particular problem. So it's no surprise that that's exactly what we're seeing here, right? It may not be a one size fits all that you just always oversample to, to match the exact class balance that you're gonna have to find that right ratio where you will see an improvement. I don't know if that answers your question. So I was thinking if I choose, for example, and, and in some cases they didn't fill out the whole table, so you can't really go through every thing that, that was happened. But in some cases, it got worse in very perfect when you choose by yeah. But that's why I said, yeah. I guess it's like a parameter you need to tweak, right? So what they do argue is that some level of 
over sampling plus under sampling always performs better than just under sampling. But one thing that they have failed to show in this kind of comparison is what happens if you just get over sampling. And they talked about it with that particular example where they showed that training decision trees now overfit. But you know, we're also lucky enough to live in a world where we've got a little bit more complex algorithms mm -hmm. than just a single decision tree, right? We live in a world where we've got random forests. So maybe a random forest would do a lot better than just a single decision tree. Maybe uh, you know, a deep neural network, which is probably good <coughs> to talk about in this group, could also do a lot better with than, than just a decision tree. Something as simple as oversampling. So, uh, thinking about trees and then oversampling, uh, it's kind of how generalizable that would be because trees have this like kind of uh, square kind of decision uh, boundaries, and then. So it could like go and pick this one, which are oversampled, but they are not generalizable because they are within the, within the data. So it is something outside. Yep. So in my experience, then you you prune your tree, right? So you you modify your tree structure itself that it's more generalizable instead of using a fully fully fit tree itself. Yeah. And when it comes to uh, I've, I've had a lot of success with oversampling and random forest, so I'm like, you know, it hasn't steered me wrong yet. Okay. Um, more like a discussion I would like to do in regard to. Okay, so this that's a discussion, I have a clarification question. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. You, you want more clarifications? Please go ahead, <laughs> okay. I, I'll take my turn. Beautiful. Later. All right, my, my apologies for that. So if you go to um, where you show the. Uh, the distance thing, maybe people got it, I didn't fully get it yet. This one? So, yeah. So how, how does that work, actually? So there are uh, some values you want to, there, there are some feature vectors you want to move to V2. You want to compute the distance of. Um, and there, then you're summing over the number of classes. Yep. Um, you have some absolute um, distance. Um, now, what are the ratios? So trying to still understand. So what, what does it mean? Um, what, is the, what does this term mean? Can we go with an example? Like, let's say you have two classes, yeah. and uh, one of them has 100, one of them has 200 samples. Yeah. Out of that 100, 20 of them are like female, 80 male. So that becomes like 20 over 100. Yeah. Minus, and then we have 200, like let's say 100 of them are men, 100 women, so it becomes 100 over 200. Um, so, sorry, so this one was, uh, this one was another? Yeah, so we have two classes, yeah, like, uh, which is, let's say, breast cancer, not breast cancer, whatever. And then we have a bunch of male females in both. So let's say in this class of, uh, Breast cancer is not a good example. Something. Two but, shots. Yeah. yeah, so it's <laughs> like. <laughs> <breast cancer. laughs> so we have two 20 male, for example, and 80 female. So it's like 20 over 100. Total, like gender. And then the other side, we have like 100, 100, which is 100 over 200. So it's, it's giving you the ratio of the occurrence of a, of a specific feature for each specific class, and then you're doing a subtraction between them. Okay, right, so, so if, if uh, you've got ratio of a specific feature across classes. Or across across, across classes. classes, okay. exactly. So, you know, for instance, if you're looking at, you know, back to your example, let's say you've got men and women, and we're looking at a particular feature, which is, say, eye color, right? It just so happens, we'll say that in class one, which is, is males, there's, uh, you know, 20 people with, or 20 men with color blue, and then over the total number of occurrences, which would be, well, I guess, you're looking, uh, and then there's women who have, no, I think I'm getting that wrong now. Maybe I'll just stop. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you, you are looking at the, the ratio. Yeah. 
Okay. Now we have a discussion, and then we can we can also show the discussion. Did you also have a no, question? Discussion. discussion. I have one question. Um, so I guess that you compare smooth against oversampling. Is it against a simple oversampling, or is it oversampling um, observations close to the decision made in um, boundary using some form of so are we talking about my own personal experience or this paper? Uh, in your experience, I think one of the last points you said was your Yeah, so, no, so in, in my experience, I've just done random oversampling. I haven't done anything that focused it on anything in particular with any particular boundary or anything like that. But the data sets that, that I generally work with, are, uh, I'd say it's a lot noisier where that decision boundary is. They're not very clear, so it may not be worthwhile to, to do that. Is that a discussion or a question? Uh, a question. <laughs> well, it sounds, uh, well, kind of unrelated. My question is that uh, if the same technique can be applied with the uh, examples from both classes are uh, sufficient. Uh, they're not imbalanced. Uh, could you use the same technique or a similar generator on both uh, on both training data and to increase the, uh, the uh, cross validation accuracy? Uh, so let me just repeat the question to see if I understood. So you're asking if given a data set that's got balance that classes, is balanced. whether the introduction of smoke would improve on both sides, yes. Accuracy. Uh, I haven't mm. tried it personally. I wouldn't, I wouldn't see why it would necessarily have it. Because well, the beauty of, of smoke is that it should fill in your distribution. Yeah. Right? So there's, if, if you've got already a decision boundary that can fit the data pretty well, I don't see how <coughs> introducing new synthetic data on both sides would necessarily improve that decision boundary. And maybe there are cases where that does help, but I mean, I just... I, I think that applies to most cases because the, uh, the purpose of that generator is to capture the manifold of one training class. So it, it, if that generator uh, is like, you know, does the job properly, then it serves as a, some kind of regularization. Yes, but I guess it comes down to how the decision boundary is going to change. Right? I, I would imagine that it would change too much, but you may be right in the sense that you are introducing more training data and so in principle, with more training data, you could increase your, your accuracy. Yeah. But, I, but I like your uh, argument also that it, because you're adding some noise to your data as well, like you're filling in the population, you might, it, might have some, uh, it might have some regularization effect. Yeah, because before it was just uh, lots of data versus uh, another lots of data. Yeah. Right, uh, and after that, it's manifold versus another manifold. And that's kind of the purpose of, you know, uh, of, you know, uh, of capturing the high level abstraction of the data, pretty much similar to, you know, how you, you train, pre train uh, some kind of embedding technique that increases the performance. I agree with that point. It everything is like continuous but when it comes to categorical it's just kind of heuristic metaphor it's, it's a random way of uh, coming up with the categorical value so i don't think it's just it makes sense to generate it. even uh, especially when the categorical variables are one of the top important features maybe because when you change them you're changing like data and uh, it may not make sense anymore. Well, I mean, but you're still going to use uh, majority voting, right? So you may not change your data at all. But I, 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 I understand what you're saying with <coughs> regularization, but I, I, I guess it may be 
very uh, problem specific whether it has an impact or not. I can't say, I can't answer that in a generalizable way to say that's true for all cases. Okay, I want us to move on. Savio had a discussion on the agenda. Yeah. My, question, my question is um, based on your, your, your presentation, I felt that there is a very interesting link to uh, this whole smooth thing. To be very similar to building a KNEOS neighbor graph of your of your data, mm -hmm. and then basically populating that graph with additional points, sort of adding like yep. neighborhood embedding, like you are adding more points in the neighborhood. So in a very visual way, you could think because instead of doing that zero to one random number multiplication, you can just say that okay, that's my little network structure. And I will just go and find where my minority points are, and close to that, I will start adding more minority points on the neighborhood. So uh, I'll be honest. Before I actually read the smoke paper, I had envisioned that that's what they were doing. Yeah. Right? Just doing some k-means, uh, populating new synthetic data, and just <coughs> doing that. So I was actually surprised when I, I went into the, to the deep dive to say, oh no, they're actually just doing you know generating recent thing data with one neighbor k number of times. Yes, yes. Uh, so I, I'm not too sure why they chose this method over something like that. Which but is disappointing why didn't they compare, at least, right? Because those methods are they, used they don't for most strapping, right? Yeah, they don't they don't mention it. So I'm wondering, you know, if if I just have overlooked an yes. inherent flaw with that problem, but I mean, it's well, one, one way to kind of take that in that direction, and like in a more research way, would be like just building those graphs as you add more and more points and seeing how that graph structure is essentially changing. That would be, and, and then compare with if you would have to randomly added a node to that graph, how would that, you know, the overlap of those two, right? That's one. The other thing which I saw also, yes. just to interrupt, so yes. I imagine your arguing for a certain bootstrap approach to that though, right? So you're using your new synthetic data as your next nearest neighbors. I mean, to be honest, like, like if, if you don't, then I don't think you'd be generating. So that, that's the beauty of this algorithm, because there's that random fraction that they're adding, that you you can generate always new data points, right? Yes. If you're just doing this sort of k-means neighbors approach, and you're doing sort of a k-means, and you don't use your new population is at a point, you're just going to be going back in circles and generating the same data points over and over again. So you have to generate new data points with the synthetic data over time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that I agree, but I just thought, okay, it's, it's too much digression. So the other thing which I thought was, like in the beginning when I just saw like how we are building the paper, that it just seemed to me very, very strange that we are trying to use these Euclidean distances on the actual feature space where there is where data is clearly not separated. They are like all the minority or the real population is basically all in the heart everywhere, like in a cloud, right? There is no clear separation. It's just the illustration. That so shows. why would not I? I think somebody sort of pointed in that direction, which is like why would not I first go in some low dimensional embedding space? where these things already separate out. And then it's much easier to populate uh, just by putting out the distribution function. Like you have the distribution function of your minority data in that combined, combined feature space and you just populate that instead of doing this. So um, I, I hope someone can talk different now, but as in my experience, it's not always true. You can't always necessarily find this lower dimensional space because it's a separate series. So you know, the kind of example the kind of problems they're dealing with is where there is you know, an overlap of, you know, things aren't clearly separable. If things are clearly separable, you probably have no issue generating this decision boundary, even with huge class of thousands. But when you start to have this noisy data where you don't have a very clear decision boundary, I mean, you do relatively. But in a way, in a way, this paper is about creating synthetic data. Don't you think it's very naive that it works by simply taking the original data and adding a little bit of noise to it? But you're you're adding noise in the sense of um, along those vectors that connect your data points. Yes. So you're ensuring that your new synthetic data are filling in points where you would expect 
your distribution district buildings if you were to, you know, generate if you were to get more samples. Yeah. So I, I think that's sort of the the novelty of this paper is that it is rather quite simple, right? It's not doing anything overly complicated. The beauty of it is you don't have to worry about your distribution function or anything like that. You just use this very, very simple approach. Of just strictly, speaking, speaking, strictly speaking, many of this entire data is not even, I would say it's not even really new data because it's just some kind of linear transformation of your original data. It, it's, it's an, it is a transformation, but it's a new data in your future system. Right? Yes. But that's the whole point of it is that it's a data point that should fall into the same cluster as your class already. Yeah. So you're not really changing your structure or distribution of your data, you're just increasing the population. So again, you, know, you, you have to remember that point of what they're trying to do is deal with class balance. Yes. Right? And so from their perspective, they feel that it's better to generate maybe a noisier distribution that's more generalizable than just doing, say, oversampling or undersampling, where you may lead to no improvement or overfitting, for instance. Shan had a? Sorry, I have two questions. Uh, one is, some of those data sets are images, right? Yes. Uh, on practice, in practice, do you observe some kind of averaging effect where, like, the maybe the example of digits, you have this thing sticks, but the generated samples it becomes like a thicker because of the blurring thing that was happening. It, so I, 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 can't come, I, I don't have okay. experience in that domain, um, but I imagine that you're, you're, you're still looking at generating something with the nearest neighbor. So assuming you've got uh, already a data set that's pretty well sampled, you're not going to be generating new data that's crazy. It's just okay. going to fill in the blanks somewhere. And then your, your feature space is, I guess, individual pixels. So you may be just creating slightly noisier data, but maybe driven enough, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess it really just depends on how well you sample your space to see what crazy synthetic data you actually have. Okay, the second question is, uh, in practice, when, when you apply this algorithm, you said it's reasonable, reasonably fast. Uh, yes, so uh, I will okay. use the IMD Learn implementation. Okay. Um, it's I reasonably think fast because we can take advantage of extreme parallel processing. <laughs> oh, that's hard. Because I, I tried, I think I tried the same uh, library used on a data set of around uh, a quarter million. Okay, it so took I've worked on smaller data sets, so that it, also it, 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 took, it took forever and I just gave up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, uh, cross library and second layer. So I wonder that in both uh, we have the you can assign the weight for each class. Yes. And then do your learning. <coughs> Why not do that? So I can only speak from my own experience, and I found that doing uh, just dealing with the class weights in certain cases was sufficient enough. So it definitely improved, but it still has further improvement. Sorry? Uh, but I wonder, like, if you have any examples, because I'm, I'm using the same things over and over, at least in the term of the ratio, I, I tried 10% ratio is working. But I wonder that, okay, in which sense maybe that algorithm is not sufficient for me in practice, but I need to go and talk, think about that making in new data sets. Yeah, I think that's a, f as, as far as over, um, undersampling, oversampling, as far as the uh, class imbalance is concerned, I think you can just like, cause it's it's mathematically sort of almost equivalent to weighting your uh, cost function, right? Um, so I guess, but I think if, but if you're thinking about data synthesis, synthesis then yes, you need to, <laughs> you need to do something because yeah. weighting doesn't really produce new data for you. If, if that's the problem, because what, what also um, Jason mentioned earlier was that um, we, in, because of the uh, privacy concerns, a lot of time you don't want to use um, your original data set, if that's accurate. That's, that's correct, yes. The other thing is that I think uh, fast weighting is very uh, totally equal to oversampling without uh, 
like just pure over something. Yeah. Like, no, it's a tiny. Yeah, because it's just but, uh, adding but, up but, all the. What was the what's what's issue with that? Uh, in, in so I think in this case, yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's just adding new data, which I don't think it makes sense. It's just new data. So it's, it's just probably also have to take into consideration the time that it's developed. Right. So they don't talk a lot about changing the class weights or anything like that. There's some algorithms that could inherently do that, but maybe the algorithms that were generally available at the time didn't allow that. If, 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 so if, if, today's day, we're, we're, we're like here. Even in, in the in the paper, the baseline basically is the naive base that uh, consider both of the class as a 50-50 and then compare it based on that line. I can't say that, okay, I'm going to assign the weight and then going to normalize it and then compare it to the... Well, so it's not entirely fair. So I, I didn't show everything in the paper because they, they did talk about some other aspects. And so that is one of the things that they, they tried. They tried changing the priors on the individual classes. And I believe I, I have to dig it out, but I think there was an improvement. But I think their ultimate their ultimate conclusion is still that still performed better than just adjusting the hyperparameters of class weights on the <coughs> model. Does, does so it also depend on sorry, does it also depend on the underlying distribution of your data? Like in like for I certain would distribution? Think so, yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I keep saying in my personal experience, I've found that just adjusting the class weights on their own is not sufficient in order to perform as good as doing more of a balanced class and oversampling. So I don't know if it just happens in the domain that I've been looking at or it's generalizable, but that's at least my experience. I tend to get better results with oversampling plus that dealing with the balanced class weights. I think we're, we're about to wrap up pretty soon. If someone has wait, time for one last question. So um, a very similar type of problem with like an omni detection or outlier detection where you have a significant class imbalance. So like very small ratios of one or two percent of the minority class to the majority class. And in those cases they have totally different sets of algorithms, different approaches. So at what point do you kind of switch over from using those techniques to an imbalanced I, that's a, an excellent question. So, um, in my experience, I still stuck with more of these general general um, functions and algorithms. I haven't tried any of these specific ones. But I, I'd love to, to hear a bit more about that. Sure, I think there's no uh, clear boundary. The anomaly detection is all about uh, learning the management. This technique is also about learning the manifold. So, yeah, I think you can just mix two and get a smooth transition. Uh, that was our chief digital officer, by the way. I <laughs> thought <laughs> you had all left and I was just playing on my phone. Uh, sorry about that. Give me a thumbs up, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you again, Jason.